When I'm in the mood to add games to my collection, I start my search from the bottom. I love going to VGPC.com, picking a system, sorting by price from low to high, and trying to find a diamond in the rough. I'm a cheap guy, I'm honestly not great at mini games, and I have a short attention span and usually play in short bursts, so the bargain bin here is just where I do my best work. Let's take the NES for example. You scroll around the bottom of this list and you see gobs of sports games, light gun games, educational games, and board to game show style games, and they're not exclusively bad, they're just the genres that are most familiar with the clearance rack. For what it's worth, I'll offer quick honorable mentions to Wheel of Fortune, which plays relatively better than other games in that genre given the limitations of the NES controller, and Super Spike Volleyball and World Cup Soccer, which I think is both two of the most interesting sports games in the entire library and one of the most underappreciated carts in the entire library. There are also a lot of shooters there, but I think those deserve a second look in their own video, so for now let's skip those other groups and get straight to three super cheap NES games that don't suck very much. In fact, I don't think they suck at all. Okay, they suck a little bit, but here we go. This is a Styanax. At least that's how Merriam-Webster pronounces it. I'm not actually sure how it goes. It's one I saw on the bottom of the price charting list that I feel like I've had forever, but I'm not sure I've ever actually tried to play. It's an action platformer from 1990 and a port from an arcade game called The Astyanax, and it's primarily a left-to-right action platformer, but there are some vertical scrolling elements as well. It was developed by Acom and published by Jalico, another name I can't pronounce, who previously worked together on some real winners like Hoops and Totally Rad for the NES, but both did have other strong titles separately, and I kind of like Hoops. Astyanax here is a solid effort. Everything looks and sounds pretty solid. It's not impressive, and aesthetically it can all be a little bit grating on the senses, but it does all fit together very well. The story is inoffensive enough. You're a high schooler sucked into a magical world because you've been chosen to rescue the princess, naturally. There's also like five total minutes of cutscenes before and after the title screen, and even more in between levels. And they are fairly slow and dull on their own, but it's an interesting overall amount of story and attention for a basic NES action platformer. It plays well enough. I have some issues with the level design, hit detection, and clunky platforming with your big sprite. I do like the big weapon, the swing power mechanic to discourage me from button mashing a bunch, and the big magic energy attack that uses some of your spell energy meter, which is something I didn't even notice until after my first game over. I found it really hard, but I'm not surprised, because as I mentioned, I suck at a lot of games like this. But it was really interesting enough that I wanted to keep going, so I turned on some cheats just to see a little more, and I enjoyed it. If you're the same, I recommend the Infinite Spell Energy Cheat. You preserve a mostly intact game experience, but knowing you can spam that spell in a bind. It's really helpful. The best part of this game is naturally all the cameos. You've got Skeletor as this bad guy minion here, Loki as the main bad guy Blackhorn, Tinkerbell as your trusty pixie sidekick named Cutie, and Astyanax himself from Greek mythology. I even read this cutscene dialogue as Ric Flair. Woo! Though it's probably supposed to sound more like Keanu Reeves. Whoa. All kidding aside, I'm really glad I tried this game. Even though I cheated, I definitely enjoyed myself, and I'd give it like 3 out of 5 stars. Cute star stickers, of course. Which doesn't sound awesome, but think of it less as a critical review and more how likely I am to recommend this to a friend with an NES. If 0 is literally never and 5 is literally always, then 3 is technically more often than not, and I think that fits. It's mediocre, but it's just not bland or forgettable, and given the price tag, I think it's usually worth a shot. The next game on this not so prestigious list is Iron Sword Wizards and Warriors 2, aka the one with Fabio on the label. It's the 1989 sequel to Wizards and Warriors, except that one was developed by Rare and published by Acclaim, while this one was made by Zippo Games, aka the guys responsible for those killer Sesame Street NES titles. The internet says it's a platformer, but it's also pretty actiony and adventure -y. Even though the best action here is just to avoid enemies since your sword swing sucks. So maybe it's just a platform adventure. 
Unlike Astyanax in the third game I'll talk about, I do have a lot of nostalgia for this one, and it is one of the games I've owned the longest for this system. It's not as good as the predecessor in any sense. No matter how much you love Fabio, even the label art for the first one is better. Seriously, look how ripped this guy is. This one's also aesthetically a little more bland. There's a lot of repetitive graphic and sound elements. Everything looks and sounds crisp, I guess. The gameplay is inconsistent from feature to feature. I've already mentioned that the sword reach is horrible. Platforming is weird and frustrating, at first, and yet I believe it's totally fair and well made. I promise, it just takes a while to get used to. And finally, there are some extremely helpful spells to compensate for that sword reach. Maybe the toughest thing about this game is that the first few minutes are very off-putting. There's no real story or introduction. You're almost immediately lambasted by some annoying evil dirty birds that you'll have a heck of a time getting rid of. And you don't really know how to start. Kuros, aka the guy so inaccurately represented by Fabio on the label, has these big off-putting googly bug eyes popping out of his helmet. At least until you get an actual helm upgrade later on. I didn't mean to capture a screenshot to make it look like he's wearing a turkey on his head, but there is enough mountainside turkey here to make Castlevania blush. I hope you like sliding down mountainsides when you miss your jumps in this first level. Whee! I promise that once you upgrade your sword, play around with your familiar spell, and get used to the weird platforming, you'll get to enjoy the good parts of the game. The exploration and adventure. And you'll stop worrying so much about why this knight in shining armor doesn't know how to use a sword. Just like last game, I admit I cheated to get a little farther, and I enjoyed myself more because of it. There's an unlimited magic cheat that I've found gave me a nice boost without totally ruining my experience, and don't be shy about giving it a try if you like. Most people won't think this game is as good or interesting as Astyanax. I'd still give it a 3 out of 5 fun shiny star stickers, and I do think it's worthwhile for more NES owners than not. It's quirky and weird, and you have to power through that first 5 to 10 minutes, but don't take it too seriously and you'll have some fun. Bye Fabio! Our final Cheapskate Award winner today is Legacy of the Wizard, a member of the larger Dragon Slayer series developed by Falcom in 1989, two years after its Japanese release, with this one published stateside by Broderbund. Wikipedia calls it, and I quote, an action RPG platform adventure. It's kind of the opposite of a Styanax for me in that I didn't even realize I had it until looking at my shelf, and I had definitely never tried it before. It's a very nondescript looking cartridge, and it's not a game people talk about very much. However, as soon as I popped it in and turned it on, it gave me a very good first impression. It just feels like a big game with the potential of an exciting mystery. Most of my friends growing up didn't have Nintendos, or the internet, so when I got a new game from a garage sale without a box, usually I had zero help whatsoever trying to figure out what the heck it was. Some games were just too confusing or hard for me to think they were good at all. Looking at you, Hydelide. But, every once in a great while, Mom would bring home a North and South, or a Clash at Demon Head, that turned out to be a really quirky gym that held my interest way longer than I expected. Now, I haven't spent much time with this one, but for some reason it gives me that same awesome feeling. And I look forward to playing a little more in the future. It looks and sounds good enough, though nothing is aesthetically memorable at all. It does control and play just fine, with only a few minor quirks. I always enjoy having different party members with unique strengths and weaknesses, it's also engaging that they're all a family, just kind of living in this cabin right above this awful dungeon full of traps and monsters and horrific things. Also, the pet Pochi looks like a chonky little dragon. And y'all know how much I like dragons. Or is he a dinosaur? This is Kirby. This is Kirby on drugs. I don't really know, considering in the cabin he looks like a dog. Doesn't matter, he's a good boy. I feel a little slighted in the story department. So little information is offered, it feels like it could have been better developed to both players' benefit and their enjoyment, but you find yourself filling in a lot of the gaps with your imagination. I do know that I'm half an hour in, and the only real story information I have is directly from the internet. On that note, just like previous games, if you're like me you'll need to cheat a little to get much joy from this one. But not with cheat codes, more with guides or a walkthrough. Though I hear eventually it gets pretty tough, so maybe cheat codes too. No shame for me, my friends. I give this one a 3 out of 5 shiny fun sticker stars. 
honestly even consider it a 4, but not for too long. It just feels too dated and frustrating, and there aren't any outstanding facets that make me feel it belongs in the vast majority of collections, but more often than not, I'd still recommend it. It's easily the most interesting game of the trio I've looked at today. It's actually what inspired me to make this video. And, given its big scope and small price, it might be one of the better bang for your buck games in the entire NES library. If you have any interest in Metroidvania tropes, or just chonky little dino dog dragons with funny names, give this one a try. I doubt you'll regret it. I know I don't have the most credibility as a critical reviewer. For that kind of stuff, you should probably find somebody who, you know, can actually get somewhere in these games without cheating. But I hope you enjoyed these suggestions in a practical sense, because I have a passion for trying to find good cheat games and I'd like to share that. Speaking of cheat, let's talk about what you should do with all that money you saved buying these games instead of more expensive rare ones. I hope you'll consider giving some of it to the Children's Miracle Network. I'll put links in the description for more information, but know that they are a great, highly efficient charity, and I really think you should check them out. Thanks all, and take care out there.